and um, good morning. It's good to see some familiar faces that have been on other virtual talks we've done in the past. So um, my name is Lauren Avellino. I am the manager of community affairs at New York Presbyterian Brooklyn Methodist Hospital. I'm joined today by our community affairs coordinator, Stephan Beasley, and also Dr. Alishetti, who will be presenting to you today on heart failure. Uh, I'm going to mute those of you who are not speaking. Um, we have a lot of content to get through. Uh, so we're going to, as we've done in the past, uh, we are going to first share the slides and then we're gonna open it up for Q&A afterwards. If you do have questions throughout the presentation, you can type them in the chat. You can either type in the chat to everyone or type them to me or Stefan, and we will um, pass them over to Dr. Alishetti. Um, so if uh, your chat box should be on the bottom of the screen, uh, you should see it, a uh, box that yeah. says chat. Uh, so, and we'll, I'll put a note in there. Welcome all. So you'll, you should see when I press enter, you should see a little notification or a little red dot on the chat box that says that there's a new chat in there. So um, I do want to take a moment to uh, thank our partners. This lecture is a collaboration, is a result of a collaboration between New York Presbyterian Brooklyn Methodist Hospital, Good Neighbors of Park Slope and Heights and Hills, uh, the Park Slope Center for Successful Aging. So, um, you know, until we're able to do things in person again, we're going to be doing them via Zoom. So, which it has its, it has its pros, it has its cons, but for now we're doing things virtually. Um, so I just want to thank Heights and Hills and also Good Neighbors of Park Slope. Uh, we'll put some resources from both organizations in the chat box uh, later. And uh, Andy Peretz, who's the Vice President of Good Neighbors of Park Slope, couldn't be here, but um, she wanted me to send her regards. And um, I just want to make another note. Me, there are a plenty of other uh, lectures coming up. Uh, next week, we'll be doing uh, multiple sclerosis in older adults. Two weeks from today, October 29th, we'll be doing uh, stroke versus aneurysm. Then we have a talk on neck pain and there'll be more to come. So stay tuned for more information. So with that, we are going to dive into the presentation. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, New York Presbyterian Brooklyn Methodist, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Alishetti. So um, for, and I apologize for those of you who are on um, our last Zoom, we did cover this information, but basically, you know, New York Presbyterian as uh, Brooklyn Methodist is one of 10 campuses that are part of the New York Presbyterian enterprise, which spans into Brooklyn, Queens, Lower Manhattan, all the way up into Hudson Valley. And um, the hospital serves, together the hospital serves, you know, millions of patients a year. Um, and there are actually, if you were in the last time, there are updated stats on this. I had 2018 stats, these are now 2019. Um, so you can see, um, you know, the hospital is a busy place, uh, certainly. And um, if you go to the next slide, I could talk a little bit about Brooklyn. Um, so we are located in Park Slope on 7th Avenue between, um, on 6th Street between 7th and 8th Avenues. Uh, we see, uh, you know, 30, uh, over 36,000 patients a year. We have a number of services, and, and you can see all those little blue dots on the map are our medical group practice locations. So there are locations throughout Brooklyn, and I know most of you are probably joining us from Park Slope, but um, we have um, services in many different neighborhoods. We also do provide uh, virtual and on-demand services, which we will share with you at the end of the presentation. But there's another piece to this work. There's the medical piece, and then there's also our commitment to our community, which is um, on the next slide. So this is really um, Stefan and my, this is our bread and butter. This is the work that we, we do at the hospital. And um, we provide a number of uh, free community presentations, just like this one today. Uh, we have a number of support groups at the hospital. There is actually a heart failure support group run by one of our other physicians, Dr. Ramsubu. Um, so we can include information about that in the chat as well. Uh, they, they were meeting in person and now I think they're gonna be meeting virtually. 
So we will include more of that in, in the chat. And if anyone has any questions about the work that we do in the community, please definitely let me know. And uh, with that, I believe that, oh, well, of course, can't forget where can, oh, yes, there's a question about where, um, where can we see a list of all the presentations that have been offered? Uh, John, I think you and I might have been emailing last week, so um, I can send you that, but there's actually, there's going to be um, in the link, uh, in the chat box, we'll put a link to all of our presentations, which is uh, offhand, it's events.myp.org slash Brooklyn, but we'll make sure actually Stephanie can pop that into the chat for where you can find all of our virtual presentations, all of our support groups that are offered as well. So Stefan will pop that into the chat. And then in terms of, you know, the giant construction site across the street from the hospital is going to be the home of the Center for Community Health, which we are super excited about. It's uh, slated to be open in February, 2021. Uh, COVID did put us a little bit behind schedule, but it's still, um, it's coming. It's right around the corner. So uh, basically this is a same day uh, ambulatory procedure building. Um, there's going to be, um, 12 different operating rooms um, for same day procedures like colonoscopies, endoscopies, gastroenterology, uh, 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 knee replacements, same day surgeries. Um, so that's, that's gonna take place in that building. The top floor will have an ambulatory infusion center. Uh, there'll be a women's health center. So it's really exciting. It's coming soon. And um, another feature of the building, which is not mentioned on the slide is that there will be uh, Plenty of conference rooms that are available to community-based organizations to use uh, as meeting space. So if anyone has any questions about that or if you're affiliated with another community-based organization or nonprofit, please let me know. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Alashetti. Um, so Dr. Alashetti, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, your background and then um, take it away. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is Dr. Alashetti. I am one of the heart failure physicians here at Brooklyn Methodist. Um, a little bit about myself, I am actually originally from California, as you can probably tell from my background, I'm from San Francisco. Um, I came out to New York actually originally for Heart Failure Fellowship, which I did over at Columbia, um, and then stayed with the NYP family, so here I am at Brooklyn Methodist. Um, so it's me and Dr. Ramasubu, who uh, Lauren mentioned, um, we're the two heart failure physicians here at Brooklyn Methodist. Um, but we're actually part of a bigger family. There's another heart failure physician at, um, at Queens. And we have uh, several heart failure physicians at NYP Cornell and a big group of uh, heart failure physicians at Columbia, as well as one up in uh, Westchester County. So we've got a big family that is spread out all throughout and we all work together and we, are, um, we collaborate uh, a lot with each other. Um, as far as the... Um, the patient support group that was just mentioned, uh, it has been virtual recently um, and it'll probably stay virtual until COVID is kind of quieted down, um, but it's a great resource, especially if uh, you do have heart failure. Uh, we talk about things like nutrition, medication management, uh, what kind of exercises are good for you, et cetera. Um, it's a very, it's a great resource. Definitely. Um, so today our talk is gonna be um, obviously about the topic that uh, I specialize in, which is heart failure. Um, so we're going to talk about what heart failure is, why we care about heart failure, uh, and we're going to spend a lot of time really talking about the risk factors for heart failure, uh, what things you can do to prevent heart failure from happening, and then we'll spend a short period of time talking about what we do once you already have heart failure. Um, and uh, spend a little bit of time afterwards talking about what we offer here at Brooklyn Methodist. So uh, the heart um, is basically, it's a pump. So the body needs to get blood throughout the body um, and blood provides a very vital uh, tool. It allows oxygen to get to the organs of the body, the muscles. And the way you get it around is that you have this uh, incredible pump in the middle of your chest that gets blood through your lungs into the body and the lungs provide the oxygen into the blood and then the heart gets it everywhere it needs to go. Um, the average heart, a normal heart is about the size of a fist uh, and you know, it beats a lot. It beats over 100,000 times a day and it pumps the equivalent of over 2,000 gallons of blood a day. So it does a lot of work. So you can imagine doing that for 100 years or more 
um, it's got to get pretty tiring. And so just like any sort of mechanical pump or any sort of a pump at all, including, for example, the engine of your car, you know, it requires a certain amount of maintenance to be able to kind of stay alive for a hundred years and, and, it, and things can go wrong with it over time. Um, so what is heart failure? So it's not a great term. We don't love the term and a lot of patients don't love that we call it heart failure. Um, but basically heart failure is when the heart begins to get weak or it's not able to provide, not able to do its function um, as well as it should be. Um, and basically, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with it. You know, they're part of it may be injured. It may just get fatigued over time. There can be genetic issues with it, but a lot of things can go wrong with the heart. Um, why is heart failure important to us? Heart failure affects a lot of people. Uh, each year, there's at least a half a million people diagnosed with heart failure. This is just people that we actually catch. Um, overall, there's probably six and a half million, and this number grows every single year. Um, it's projected to be uh, it's projected to be <coughs> 12 million by 2025, so it's going to keep growing. Um, it costs a lot of money uh, for the the country as a whole. Uh, it's estimated to cost about uh, 200 billion dollars, uh, and it's probably even more than that. Um, but it's just an estimate. Um, and unfortunately, obviously, the COVID epidemic has really showed us uh, that there's issues with health disparities in this country. And heart, fail heart failure is no exception. Um, it does affect minorities more, uh, and we see it affects African Americans at a higher rate than Hispanics. Um, but overall, minorities are, are grossly uh, more affected than uh, Caucasians um, in this country. Uh, it also does kind of cross socioeconomic uh, borders. So people that are uh, more poor, more uh, closer to the poverty level are affected more by this too. Dr. Ramasu, oh, sorry, Dr. Alashetti. <laughs> there was a uh, question that um, I think is, is topical. So um, the, the question is, what is the definition of heart disease? Is there a definition? Sure. Uh, if we're talking about just heart disease, uh, heart disease itself is basically any disorder that affects the heart. Um, I think generally when people talk about heart disease in the community, uh, most often they're talking about coronary artery disease, uh, which is basically the pipes, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but the, the arteries of the heart, the pipes that provide blood flow to the heart itself get diseased over time. And that actually is one of the causes of heart failure. Um, but when I think about heart disease, I think about any sort of disease that affects the heart. So that can be the heart becoming weak, the valves of the heart, so some of the structures of the heart getting um, breaking down. Uh, they can become leaky, they can become tight and not allow blood flow to get through very well. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong with the heart. Um, you know, again, it's a pump that beats many times a day over many, many years. So many things can go wrong with it over time. Plus, you can be born with defects and that can come up and, and show their face later on in life too. Um, so, you know, again, kind of going back to this, why do we care about heart failure? Well, not only does heart failure affect a lot of people, heart failure is, is a tough disease. Um, you know, we talk a lot about cancer in this country and outcomes of cancer. We talk about breast cancer and, you know, there's a lot of uh, drives to raise money for breast cancer. And there's a lot of things about awareness of breast cancer. There's really no drives for heart failure awareness. Um, and no one really talks about how many people it kills. But uh, at five years, people diagnosed with heart failure on average, 48% uh, of people diagnosed with heart failure are dead in five years. And so that's a mortality rate that's uh, higher than leukemia. And in fact, in, in some of the more advanced stages of heart failure, the mortality rate is similar to something like pancreatic cancer. So it's a pretty uh, deadly disease uh, if not caught early and managed early. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about here today. So heart failure has, uh, really there's four stages of heart failure and this is a new kind of um, structure of heart failure that we've been thinking of, of in this way um, for about the last 10 to 15 years. Um, so stage A is people that actually don't even have heart failure, but it's people that may have risk factors for heart failure. And so we need to kind of pay attention to those patients early and start trying to modify those risk factors 
um, to prevent them from getting heart failure or maybe reducing the chance of them having heart failure or maybe even if they develop heart failure, slowing down the progression of heart failure. Stage B is when you develop heart disease of some sort that can be considered potentially a step towards heart failure. You know, like we said, artery disease or uh, some of the valves can be affected or maybe the heart muscle is weakened, but the patient may not feel anything yet. They feel okay. They don't feel tired or anything like that. So that's stage B. So you may have something wrong with the heart, but you haven't yet developed the symptoms of heart failure. Stage C is really kind of what we would consider true heart failure. Um, and in fact, and I didn't mention this early, earlier, but heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. Um, you can have something wrong with the heart, but heart failure itself is all about how you look and feel. So the symptoms of heart failure are things like shortness of breath with exertion. So walking down the block, maybe you know, five years ago, you were able to walk 10, 15 blocks without an issue, but now you get tired after walking a block or so. And it's not just fatigue, but some people feel fatigue, some people get really short of breath and they have to stop and catch their breath and then they can go another block, stop and catch your breath. And this seems to be progressive. Um, you can get swelling in your legs, you can get swelling in your belly, you can get bloated, you can get full really quickly, uh, and start losing weight. Um, one, of the, one of the very common symptoms of heart failure is that you wake up in the middle of the night short of breath. Um, and you're noticing that you don't get comfortable at night unless you prop yourself up on more and more pillows. So sometimes we catch these patients that come into the hospital and they say, you know, for the last year, I haven't been able to, to lay down flat in my bed and I'm actually having to sleep now in a chair. You know, those are symptoms of heart failure. So that falls into stage C. And then stage D uh, is really kind of where, you know, we get kind of, we get patients in the stage D category more often. We like to see them more in stage B and C, but stage D is this advanced category where we're at a point where medications may not be enough anymore. And then we need to talk about things like uh, heart replacement therapies where um, we do transplants or we do a mechanical pump to kind of help get blood to the rest of the body because the heart itself isn't able to do it. And that's what we call advanced heart failure. Uh, so you can see there's a different progressive um, levels of heart failure. Um, so we're going to focus mostly on that stage A, so the risk factors of heart failure and heart disease uh, and how we can kind of help reduce those or prevent those. So these are really the biggest risk factors for heart disease and heart failure. Um, so high cholesterol, high blood pressure, uh, physical inactivity, uh, obesity, uh, or even just being overweight, type 2 diabetes, uh, smoking, excessive alcohol use, and other substance use or drug use. Um, so let's dive into each of these a little bit. So cholesterol um, is probably one of the bigger uh, risk factors for heart failure. And what is cholesterol? So cholesterol is basically, it's something that you get uh, through your diet. Um, and some of it's produced also by the liver, which is more of a genetic component to it. But this is basically what builds up in the arteries uh, of um, the body, including the heart. Uh, so you can get buildup of, of uh, plaque, of cholesterol plaque in the arteries of the, of the head, going to the brain or in the heart. And as that builds up more and more and more, it can completely block off blood flow to a part of the brain or for us, a part of the heart. Uh, and when that blocks off blood flow to a part of the heart, the heart muscle gets starved for oxygen and it then starts to die. And that heart muscle is no longer able to participate and pumping blood out to the rest of the body and so the heart gets weaker. So if we can prevent that, that artery disease from forming ahead of time, uh, then we can potentially uh, reduce that. And actually artery disease is the biggest cause in the U.S. of heart failure. Uh, heart attacks and uh, heart disease or artery disease are, is the largest cause of heart failure in the U.S. So if we can prevent that ahead of time, that'd be great. Um, so when you get your blood tested for cholesterol, there's four components of that uh, cholesterol test. There's a total cholesterol, there's an HDL cholesterol, there's an LDL cholesterol, and there's a triglyceride level. So the HDL cholesterol is actually a good cholesterol. That's the one you get from nuts and olive oil um, and from moderate alcohol use. 
Um, so that's one of the things that we're actually trying to drive up. So sometimes we tell people to take fish oil supplements and we try to help tell people to increase, increase their nut um, intake or fish intake. And that really drives that HDL up. And that's because that HDL actually acts as a scavenger in the blood to kind of remove the bad cholesterol. So the bad cholesterol is the LDL. Um, and that is the one that contributes to that buildup in, of the plaque in the arteries. So we look at that level and the total cholesterol sometimes if, um, if we're not really able to interpret the bad cholesterol. And then finally, there's a the triglyceride level, um, which has its own risk factors, uh, can cause things like pancreatitis, and it can also lead to uh, atherosclerosis. Um, there's several factors that lead to uh, increased um, cholesterol level besides just what you eat. Um, being overweight, obesity can lead to it, physical inactivity can lead to it, smoking can actually drive this up, drinking a lot, especially triglycerides, heavy alcohol use can drive that up. Um, but yes, diet is a, is a major factor. And then again, as I mentioned, genetics is a factor for some people. Okay. Um, so how do you manage your cholesterol? So um, your physician should be checking your cholesterol pretty regularly. We start as early as 20 years of age, and if things look okay, we may just go every five years. But as you get older, closer to middle age, we'll start checking more regularly every one to two years. Um, once we start noticing that they're getting close to um, close to high or even low high, um, just a little bit higher than normal, then we'll start really focusing mostly on lifestyle changes. So uh, weight loss, diet, um, you know, focusing on a healthy diet, trying to avoid mm -hmm. things with high saturated <laughs> fats, um, exercising more, trying to do more moderate exercise. And then if you're a smoker, trying to get you to stop smoking. Yes. Um, so when we talk about diet, you know, uh, we try to really focus on moderation with diet. Um, so, you know, anything in excess, as uh, you know, your parents probably told you, anything in excess is bad for you. Um, so, what we say is really portion control. If it's if you have something that you really like, you know, just try to eat less of it. So if you're eating steak every day, um, you know, that's probably too much steak, right? So let's back off and maybe once a week or twice a week. Um, you know, just it's all about decreasing uh, what anything unhealthy that you're eating and trying to really focus more on those greens, those leafy vegetables. Um, those are the things that are going to help reduce the cholesterol in your blood. Okay. Um, okay, the biggest risk factor, in fact, when we look at studies, if we were to take high blood pressure away completely, we would probably decrease heart failure in this country by about half. So the biggest risk factor for heart failure in this country is, is high blood pressure. Um, and unfortunately, almost half of Americans have high blood pressure. Many Americans don't even know that they have high blood pressure. They don't have symptoms of it. And, you know, it's what uh, we call the silent killer. We walk around with blood pressures through the roof and not even know it and it can lead to things like uh, strokes and heart attacks. Um, and over time, it actually leads to stiffening of the arteries. Um, you can imagine that your blood pressure is having to, your, your arteries of the body, the blood vessels of the body are having to deal with this elevated pressure and over time, those walls are going to start breaking down a little bit, and they're going to get stiff, right? Uh, just like you know, the pipes in your your uh, just for example, a hose, right? Over time, hoses start to break down; they start to leak. Um, so the blood vessels of the body can kind of do a similar thing. So we try to maintain that by reducing that blood pressure uh, and keeping it uh, at a, a tolerable level. So a normal blood pressure is actually below 120 over 80. Um, once you reach about one above 140 over 90, we start treating it with medications. But usually in that 120 to 140 range, um, we'll try to manage more of the risk factors. So again, we try to get you to exercise more, um, reduce your alcohol intake and your fat intake. Again, eat more fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, if you're overweight or obese, actually losing weight can drop your blood pressure significantly. For every pound, you go down by about six millimeters mercury of, uh, of your uh, blood pressure. So it actually makes a huge difference losing weight. Um, and again, once you get over 140 over 90, then we'll start managing with medications. And then once you're on medications, it's very important that you take those medications daily uh, without missing doses to really get this as well controlled as possible. 
over time, if the blood pressure is not controlled, it can lead again to things like heart attacks, heart failure, strokes, because you are you do have arteries to your brain as well, and those can get affected, um, and kidney disease, which is a major comorbidity of people with heart failure. Um, moving on to physical inactivity, um, many Americans don't get enough exercise. Uh, and I think, you know, places like New York and California, we're probably better off than much of the country, but still my, many of us don't exercise enough. Um, what's recommended by the AHA, by the American Heart Association, is that at least 30 minutes of moderate activity for five days a week is what's recommended by the AHA. So a, moderate activity depends on who you are. So, you know, we really want, want to get your heart rate up a little bit. So, you know, if you're young and um, fairly capable of doing, you know, heavy activity, then maybe it's a job for about 30 minutes a day. Um, but if that's too tough, even just going out and going for a walk for 30 minutes is, is great. You know, we would love for you to go out and get 30 minutes of walking time in. Really just try to set some time aside and do it. And I know we're very busy and I know it's been tough, especially with COVID, to get out there. Um, it's nerve wracking, definitely. Um, but, you know, put on a mask and get some fresh air and uh, get out there in just 30 minutes. The weather's beautiful, right? This is a great time to get outside and get some activity in. Um, so I guess I had a slide on this, but um, what's considered moderate activity, again, walking, uh, biking, if you're able to do that at a leisurely pace, yoga, um, you know, downhill skiing, probably I would consider that maybe more, more, uh, uh, more than moderate activity, more vigorous. Um, but golfing is okay, uh, doubles tennis is great. Uh, even just activities around the house like yard work and mowing, mowing the lawn, doing some gardening, that's, uh, that's activity too, that's exercise. Um, and if you're doing the job that requires some work like custodial work and farming, um, that counts too. So if you include moderate activity in your day otherwise, then that counts as well. Okay, and then we talked a little bit about this already, but Obesity and overweight is a being overweight is a major problem in the U.S. that has a lot of issues um, with downstream effects on your health, and uh, you know it probably affects anywhere between uh, fifty percent to a third of Americans, um, and it does again lead to uh, many forms of heart disease, not just heart failure, but it can lead to uh, even mild coronary disease. Um, and what is considered obesity? So basically, if the if your waist is uh, as large or larger than your hips, um, we do see that there's an increase in um, risk of heart disease. So kind of the way you hold your your um, obesity actually makes a difference. So more of that that apple shaped body where the obesity is more central, versus the pear shape where more of the weight's down in your um, hips we do see that there's an increased risk with the apple-shaped body compared to the pear-shaped. Um, and so what we consider uh, the weight circumference cutoffs for males versus women um, is 40 inches. If your waist is larger than 40 inches, that goes along with obesity for men and 35 for females. Okay. What causes obesity? So uh, obesity is not completely um, it's, it is related to activity and poor eating habits, but some of it is also just as you get older and your genes. Um, again, we talked about regular exercise. Your body does require regular exercise to kind of start breaking down some of the caloric intake. If your body doesn't use up all the calories that you take in, it then stores it as fat. Um, poor eating habits. So if you're eating things with high saturated fat levels, um, that then is more likely to uh, get absorbed and, and then stay as fat. Uh, things with high caloric value, so sweets, uh, saturated fats, uh, those, are, those are the things that are going to stick in your body. Uh, things like greens and fruits, um, those are the things that are going to help reduce your weight, uh, as well as nuts. Um, as you get older, several things change. Um, hormones change uh, and your metabolism slows down. Uh, more specifically, the amount of calories your body uses at rest, that goes down. And so your, your caloric intake, if that stays stable, you're going to hold on to more of that as, uh, as weight. And then genes do play a, a significant role in um, obesity as well, unfortunately. 
Uh, and then, you know, a lot of us have been dealing with stress, increased stress um, in, in these recent months, but definitely stress, depression, sleep deprivation, those all play a role in, uh, in uh, weight gain and obesity. And as I mentioned, obesity has been linked to heart disease and high blood pressure and high cholesterol and heart failure and heart attacks. It's also been associated with type two diabetes. It's also been associated with obstructive sleep apnea, which for us is another risk factor for heart failure. Um, it's been associated with several cancers, including breast and colorectal. It's associated with Alzheimer's disease, with dementia, with depression, uh, chronic pain. Um, and arthritis. Uh, just imagine your body's having to carry around that much more weight, your joints get more wear and tear on them, and you develop arthritis uh, earlier rather than later. Um, so obesity has a lot of repercussions, unfortunately. Uh, I think we've kind of talked about this quite a bit, but I'm happy to answer more questions about this uh, at the end. Uh, and then finally, diabetes. Um, diabetes is uh, very common and type 2 diabetes is more common. Type 1 diabetes, diabetes is more of a genetic uh, issue and type 2 diabetes is, is uh, gained um, usually through diets um, and basically what happens is the body doesn't produce enough insulin or the body becomes resistant to, in, resistance to insulin um, and so it's unable to really, the insulin is no longer effective and as a result, the blood sugar levels rise in your, in your body uh, because insulin is important in kind of reducing the blood sugar levels in your body and using them appropriately or, or putting them in storage if you need to. Um, risk factors are family history. Um, so again, genetics is an important part of this. Your race or ethnic background. I come from an ethnic background with a very high level of diabetes. Um, so that definitely plays a role. Again, minorities also um, do have a disproportionate amount of diabetes. Um, age, as you get older, there's an increased risk of diabetes, specifically as you get beyond the age of 45. Um, and gestational diabetes. So if you were a diabetic at the time of pregnancy, you know, for many people that resolves after pregnancy, but it puts you at a higher risk down the line for um, developing diabetes. Uh, and the complications of diabetes, are, there are several complications of diabetes, um, but in the heart, it can lead to increased or more aggressive forms of artery disease. Um, and we do see this when we do uh, angiograms of people with diabetes, it affects all their blood vessels throughout the heart. Um, and even the small blood vessels are significantly affected. So it can be a very aggressive form of heart disease can also affect the arteries to your legs, to your arms, to your brain, and can put you at risk of stroke, risk of heart attacks. It can affect the arteries of the kidneys, and it can actually affect the tissue of the kidneys and lead to kidney disease. Um, and it's one of the most common causes of renal failure, kidney failure, um, leading to people being on dialysis or needing kidney transplants. Um, and it can also kind of make the other disease processes worse. So cholesterol can get worse. Um, high blood pressure can get worse, and it's part of a metabolic syndrome. Actually, those three diseases, high cholesterol, uh, high blood pressure, and diabetes mm -hmm. go together as a, as a syndrome. We see them all together very commonly, and they kind of feed each other, fortunately. Um, it can affect your vision. It can affect the blood vessels to your eyes and make you uh, lose your vision uh, sooner. It can lead to cataracts at an earlier age. Um, and it can cause nerve damage, and uh, many people end up with numbness in their feet and their toes. It's usually the first place that you start feeling the effect, or you get a burning pain, and, and this is related to nerve damage uh, in the legs and the toes. And you know, I will say that while there are some people that respond to medications, this kind of pain, unfortunately, for many people, medications don't do it, and it's a very difficult uh, issue to deal with. It's very painful for many people. Um, so really controlling diabetes once you're diagnosed with it um, is very important. Um, but then even trying to avoid developing diabetes, we know you have risk factors for diabetes. The same things we talked about, your diet, low sugar diets, um, and exercise early on and, and controlling obesity. Those are all very um, helpful things in trying to prevent developing diabetes. And when you start developing kind of the pre-diabetes form, um, you know, if you're you're seen by your doctor and they tell you your hemoglobin A1C, which is one of the markers of diabetes, is kind of on the low 
is on the high normal end or even maybe um, slightly above uh, normal, trying to control your diet and exercise at that point can really help prevent progression to more severe diabetes and more, um, more of these issues that you get from uncontrolled diabetes. Um, and then smoking. Uh, smoking is a very controllable process, right? Um, you know, I know it's a, it's a, it's a very significant habit forming uh, issue, but controlling smoking um, can make a big difference. So smoking leads to similar to diabetes, very aggressive forms of plaque buildup. And we see 20 and 30 year olds with, with plaque buildup in their arteries from smoking. So it can happen at an earlier age. Um, it affects uh, the blood vessels can thicken, they can narrow, you can get heart attacks very early. Um, and it can affect other cells too. You know, it affects your skin and it affects, um, you know, can affect your brain tissue. It affects many, many tissues all throughout. It's a very inflammatory uh, process. And it affects uh, the other risk factors again, especially cholesterol. Triglycerides go up, HDL goes down, LDL goes up. Um, and this isn't just cigarettes. This actually also includes um, chewing tobacco as well as um, electronic cigarettes. We've had now several studies that have showed that e-cigarettes are, are equally bad uh, in many ways. Maybe not as bad for the lungs, although you know, pre-COVID we had a lot of, a lot of stories about vape lung, uh, which was a pretty big issue. But um, it does also affect the arteries. Um, so it is, it is not um, necessarily the safest way to replace therapy. Uh, benefits of quitting are, are actually pretty quick. Within a one to two years, you can see uh, the risk of developing heart disease, or actually the risk of heart attacks goes down, almost goes back to normal within one to two years of quitting smoking. Um, doesn't necessarily reverse any heart disease that may have already happened, but the risk of heart attacks themselves actually goes down almost to normal. Um, you know, things like your taste, your sense of smell and taste that you may have lost from quitting uh, from smoking can come back. That cough uh, that smokers have can go away. Breathing gets much better and it's easier to be active. Um, and then, you know, just financially, you know, especially here in New York, I think a pack of cigarettes is over $20. So just imagine being free from that burden. Um, you know, so when Obviously, it's a process. Getting um, quitting is a process. So, first steps are deciding that you want to quit, deciding you're ready to quit, and then people have different ways of quitting. People have different ways of uh, being successful quitting. Some people may be able to stop cold turkey. For many people, that's too difficult, um, and that's not a bad thing. It's understandable. It's uh, you know your body's dependent on this. It's not just a habit, but your body's actually developed a chemical dependence on this. So. Uh, talk to your doctor when you're ready to quit and there's ways to help you out, whether it's through patches or medications or other kinds of therapies like behavioral therapy and hypnotism has even been shown to help with this. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about alcohol intake. So a lot of people ask about this, talk, talk about um, what's a safe amount of alcohol to use. So in heavy amounts, alcohol is bad for the heart. Um, we talk about for men, a moderate amount or a healthy amount is less than one to two drinks per day. And in women, it's less than one drink a day. What does that count as? It's not a full glass of wine. You can't just fill it to the brim and say, that's my one drink for the day. Or you can't just pour vodka into a glass and say, I'm drinking one drink a day. So there's very specific definitions of this. It's a 12 ounce beer, a four ounce glass of wine, or uh, one and a half ounces, ounces of 80 proof alcohol. So it's about a shot of, uh, of liquor. Um, so the risks of drinking more than that, again, the triglycerides go up, the cholesterol can go up, it can cause you to weight, gain weight, it increases your risk of diabetes, increases your risk of stroke, and independent of all those things, it itself is a risk factor for heart failure. And um, when you already have heart failure, it can make heart failure get worse. If you already have a diagnosis of heart failure, even drinking in moderation can be unhealthy for your heart and it can cause progression of the heart failure. So we actually recommend once you've been diagnosed with heart failure to not drink any alcohol at all. Alcohol has to go at that point. Okay. Um, now there are benefits prior to being diagnosed with heart failure of moderate alcohol use, um, which are, uh, there's potentially an anti-inflammatory uh, aspect to it. It may actually improve your good cholesterol 
and it may actually uh, prevent clot formation. So there are some, there are several studies now that show that drinking in moderation may be helpful. But, and I say this with uh, emphasis, if you are not a drinker, it is not recommended that you start drinking for those benefits. There's many other ways to do it. And there, that your trade-off from starting drinking uh, is not, it's not there. So you're actually better off if you're not a drinker, staying not a drinker, than picking up this habit for the sake of the health um, benefits of it. We prefer that you go the route of exercise and weight loss than picking up alcohol. All right. So just to kind of summarize, knowing the numbers, uh, we talked about blood pressure goals. We want your blood pressure below 120 over 80. Above that, we start talking about behavior modifications or medications. Um, we want uh, your, your blood sugar levels controlled, so normal blood sugar levels are less than 100 when you've been fasting, um, and we'll monitor that also through blood tests. We want uh, your weight controlled, so anything over a BMI or weight, weight circumference uh, above 35 or 40 for a male, a BMI uh, above 25 would be considered overweight, so we want to try to get you down below that, um, also to control your hypertension and your diabetes. Um, Exercise, we talk about 30 minutes a day, five days a week of moderate intensity exercise. And then controlling your cholesterol. So we want your HDL levels above 50 or so. We want your LDL levels uh, at a particular goal that we'll set with uh, you based on your blood tests and your other risk factors. Um, so that basically concludes the uh, control of the risk factors portion. Um, and uh, you know the other big piece is of course making sure that you're seeing your primary care doctor regularly um, because you know unfortunately here in this community we see a lot of patients that have fallen off the map with their primary care doctor and haven't been seen in many many years and then they come in many times very very late in their disease process um, when there's very limited things that we can offer so we can kind of control those symptoms early on those issues early on we can really help people, I think, more so than we can later on in the disease process. So once you've developed heart failure, that's when we kind of, we become very important, the heart failure doctors. Um, so a lot of those things we talked about, you can start working with those, with those risk factor modification things with your primary care doctor, or if you already have a cardiologist with your cardiologist. Once you have heart failure, you know, heart failure is a treatable disease, actually, and that's why um, we're very important, I think, once you've developed heart failure. We have several medications now. Um, this is a very short list, but we have uh, at least four medications now, two of which are new categories in just the last 10 years of medications that we know are beneficial to improving the length of life in heart failure, keeping you out of the hospital more with heart failure, um, and improving the quality of your life with heart failure. And then we have these medications that uh, basically keep the fluid off of you. They're called diuretics uh, or water pills um, that just help keep the fluid off you and keep you feeling better. Um, we don't have, unfortunately, data that shows that that keeps you alive longer, but you know, I think symptom management is a very important part of this. Um, we have uh, procedures that we can offer. So once people have a certain level of heart failure, there's an increased risk of arrhythmias or sudden cardiac death. So we can put in pacemakers and defibrillators to help protect you from that. Um, if you do have coronary artery disease, we can send you to the appropriate cardiologist to help manage the coronary disease and potentially put in stents if needed. Um, and then that stage D, we talked about the really advanced heart failure when the heart's really kind of at the end of its life. And, uh, you're really not able to sustain yourself with a heart anymore. Then we offer other things like a heart transplant to replace that um, mechanical device where we can actually surgically implant a mechanical device into the heart, which pulls blood out of the heart and pumps it to the body to help replace part of the effects of the heart. Uh, and, um, you know, when you come into the hospital and you're in shock, we have ways of managing that as well. Okay. Um, and talk about a little bit, I think I mentioned this at the beginning of the program, but we have a very large family of heart failure doctors across the NYP family. Um, we have, I think, I'm not sure if this is still up to date, but 31 cardiologists and we're growing family across Columbia, Cornell, here at Brooklyn Methodist, at Queens, um, and up in Westchester County, and we're, we're growing. There's more heart failure doctors joining us, and we're also very much uh, 
very well uh, associated with the other cardiologists at all those uh, facilities, as well as internal medicine doctors. Um, and our goal is really to provide you with kind of a comprehensive care for your problems. Um, and there's, we talked a little bit about the devices. Uh, we also have a centralized heart failure program. So if um, you're a patient that requires a lot of adjustment of medications or um, you, know, you find yourself coming into the hospital pretty regularly with heart failure, we have ways of trying to prevent you from coming in by monitoring you as an outpatient with phone calls. And we have a, um, a device that we can send you that has a blood pressure cuff and a, and a scale and we watch your weight and make sure you're not gaining fluid weight. And if you are, we'll call you and say, hey, we need you to take a little bit more of your water pill to get that fluid off. Um, so we have several ways of monitoring you to try to keep you out of the hospital. Um, so with that, uh, this is the uh, phone number here to call if you do want to see us for any reason. Um, and uh, we'll pass it back. Hey, so I, are you ready for questions, Dr. Alashetti, yes. or no? Oh, okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> before I go to the chat, um, does anybody want to ask any questions over the camera? Mm, okay. Well, I guess not. So in the chat, there was a question. Um, <clears throat> so John asked, his first question was, uh, that there, he has swelling in his legs and the doctor said um, that they're not worried, but why um, is swelling a factor in heart failure? That's a good question. So um, there are several causes of swelling in the legs. Um, heart failure is only one of them, but as you get older, the veins of your legs, uh, which are respond responsible for the blood returning back to the heart, they have valves in them that prevent blood from going backwards and back down into your legs. And those break down over time. And as those fail, that can also lead to swelling. Um, and one of the risk factors for that can be having spent a lot of time on your legs throughout your life. If, you're, if you worked in a position that, um, where you were standing a lot, that can definitely uh, increase the risk for that. But with heart failure, um, the reason that it leads to uh, swelling in the legs, and I, I like to use this uh, metaphor of a traffic jam. So the heart does two things. Number one, it pumps blood out to the body. But two, it has to accept blood back into the heart to be able to pump blood out to the body. And as the heart starts to get weaker and, and not, it's not able to do that job that well, blood doesn't go into the heart as well, and it starts to back up. You know, it's just, it starts to back up as a traffic jam. And one of the components of blood is fluid. And that fluid starts to seep out of the blood vessels into the tissues. And so you get swelling in the legs. Um, it can also seep into the lungs and you can get fluid buildup in the lungs. And that's what adds to some of that shortness of breath in, the, in uh, your breathing. And that's what adds to you getting shorter breath walking down the street or getting shorter breath when you're laying down in bed. Um, so that's really where we start adding those diuretic medications to try to get that fluid off so you feel better. Um, you know, I'm not sure what workup your physician has done, um, but one of the things that we would typically do is an ultrasound of your heart to see what the function of the heart looks like um, to see if that's possibly a cause of that swelling. Uh, if it's not, then we would look for other causes, including that insufficiency uh, of the veins where the veins are not um, functioning completely normally. Uh, and unfortunately, there's not too much we can do about that. Sometimes we can do compression stockings to help keep the fluid off of the legs. Um, and sometimes we will also add water pills for that if it becomes more of a problem. Right, so there's one, there's one more question from, um, there's another question from Sean, and then there's another question from Eileen. So the other questions he had was, what was a, um, what's a good blood pressure monitor? Uh, just a recommendation for that. And, um, well, make the blood pressure monitor sure. recommendation and then we'll ask the next thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Omron makes a good blood pressure cuff, uh, O-M-R-O-N. Um, you know, I hate to plug a single company, but um, I've heard good things about their blood pressure cuffs and they've been pretty reliable and pretty uh, accurate. So uh, I'm a fan of theirs.
Steven, I can't hear you. Sorry. You're still muted. Sorry about that. So I was typing in there, oh, uh, Om Omron blood pressure monitors. Okay. And then um, the, I wanted to move on to another question for, from someone else, Eileen Sullivan. What should you look at in food packaging labels if you're trying to lower cholesterol um, regarding saturated fat, trans fat, or total fat? They, this is a person who gets confused with uh, all of the fats. Uh -huh. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, primarily, I like to look at mostly the, the saturated fat level. So you want that to be low. Um, that's kind of the biggest risk factor uh, in terms of uh, cholesterol levels. So really focus your, your um, focus in on that saturated fat level. All right. So the next one is from, let's see them in the chat. All right. So Roslyn has asked, um, what are PC AS or PACs that show up in our EKGs? Oh, PACs? Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so PACs are extra beats that come from the top part of your heart. So your heart not only has a plumbing system, which we talked about, which is the blood vessels that get to the heart, but your heart also has an electrical system where it starts beating at the top of the heart, so the top two chambers of the heart, and that pumps blood down to the bottom of the heart, and then the bottom of the heart, or the ventricles, have to pump blood to the rest of the body. So there needs to be a delay between the top part of the heart, called the atria, and the bottom part of the heart, called the ventricle, to allow blood to go from the top to the bottom and then out to the body, uh, or to the lungs. And so the electrical system is designed in a way where you have a pacemaker at the top of the heart, and then there's uh, then it conducts down into the bottom of the heart with a little bit of a delay. PACs are basically extra beats that start in the atria. So sometimes there can be something in the top part of your heart that is a little bit irritable and it can make the top part of your heart um, beat extra, so early before your normal pacemaker goes off. Um, PVCs are the same kind of thing that start down in the ventricle as opposed to the atria. Um, generally, PACs are not something that we worry about too much unless there's a, a lot of them uh, or people are symptomatic of them. Otherwise, it's actually a very normal thing. In fact, you know, me and Steven probably have them all the time too. More. So, um, you know, as long as you're looking for them, you'll probably find them. You know, we're not too concerned about PACs. PVCs, depending on how many of them, um, we also have, everyone has PVCs, but if there's many PVCs, like 20% of your beats are about or PVCs, then it can affect the function of your heart, and then we may want to do something about it. Okay, so we have two more questions we're going to wrap up on. Um, there was one other from John. Um, he said that the, his doctor didn't like the stress test, so they had um, their first an angiogram, ang 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 and they said uh, that they they don't have a 70 to 80 or 80 percent blockage, so they were okay. But how often should these tests now be given? Uh, good question. So, so an angiogram is really kind of the, the best way that we have right now to get a look at the coronaries to see if there's blockages or not in the arteries. We have a lot of studies now looking at whether you should put stents in for mild disease or moderate disease or if you just treat medically. Um, and what we've seen is that really, unless it's a severe blockage or it's causing symptoms um, or you're having a heart attack, the better way to manage this is medically with, med with uh, cholesterol lowering medications like statins and an aspirin. And then behavior modifications like better diet, exercise, things like that. And, and some of the things that we do medically and activity-wise can actually start reversing that disease process. So the answer to your question in terms of how, how regularly you should be getting that test, it really depends on your symptoms and the severity of your coronary disease and what your cardiologist thinks. Um, we don't do them routinely. We don't do them on a particular schedule. We really only do them if it's needed, if it's required. Um, so if there's something that tells us that there's a concerning uh, finding that needs to be uh, evaluated further with an angiogram. Otherwise, uh, you know, we'll be monitoring you. You should be getting regular visits with your cardiologist, checking your, your symptoms, checking how far you can walk, or you're getting chest pain, uh, things like that. And that really should be a tip off to whether or not you require more evaluation. 
Great, thanks. So the last question, and I also want to mention to everyone that we're going to be putting some additional resources about upcoming um, <clears throat> talks and other programming uh, in the chat. So you want to stick around to the end to get that information. Last question is from Al, and Al asks, um, does an echocardiogram check all of the arteries for blockage? What is the best test to check for artery, artery blockage? Stress test, C-scan, angiogram. Okay. Uh, an echocardiogram really doesn't look at the arteries of the heart. It looks at the, the structure of the heart, and it looks at the function of the heart. So it looks, it's a picture, basically. So it can, it can see the walls of the heart, how much they're moving, the muscle of the heart, the valves. So there's valves in the heart that prevent blood from going backwards. And you can see if those valves are leaky or if they're not allow if they're getting tight and not allowing blood to go forward. Um, and there's actually ways of measuring the pressures inside of your heart also to kind of see how bad the heart failure may be. Um, but it doesn't really get us a good look at the arteries of the heart. What it can do is say, you know, a part of the heart's not working and that's that's a part of the heart that's usually supplied by a particular artery. And then that can tip us off that there might be artery disease. Um, there's many ways of looking for blocked arteries. Uh, the simplest way is putting you on a treadmill and looking at the EKG that they do, the electric cardiogram, and see if there's any changes in that. Um, and many times that's the first test that'll happen is seeing when you exert yourself, when you jump on a treadmill, are there any findings on that EKG that change that look like there might be a blocked artery? Um, or do you develop chest pain when you're running on a treadmill? Um, we can also do that alongside echo imaging to see, again, is with exercise, is there a part of the heart that's not moving that falls into the same kind of area that a blood vessel may, may go to? There's uh, pictures we can take with a nuclear scan um, that can look for areas of the heart not getting enough blood flow. Um, and then there are CT scans we can do looking at the arteries of the heart. And then finally, there's the angiogram. The gold standard is an angiogram that ends up getting the best look at the arteries of the heart because it's a direct look at them. But there are risks involved with that. Um, it is a procedure, so we do have to bring you into the cath lab. We do have to put a small plastic tube into the body to be able to get the pictures, and there is radiation involved. And we give contrast, which is a, a dye to be able to look at the arteries. And if you have kidney problems, that can be a problem. Um, so we don't tend to just go and do the uh, angiogram right away. We tend to do some of these other tests first, and if those look okay, then we won't have to do the angiogram. Um, but if you're high risk for artery disease or you already have known artery disease, then we may go straight to the uh, angiogram. Wake up. All right. Um, do we have any other additional questions? Yeah, I have a quick question uh, mm -hmm. with, the, with the stress tests. Um, you know, I have bad knees, whatever, but I generally try to start exercising to get in somewhat decent shape before I take a stress test. Mm -hmm. But they say there's the option of they, they can give you some, you know, some drug that simulates that. And, and just the thought of that sort of scares me. Any huh. comments about that? Yeah. Uh, so we do have medications that can make the heart pump a little bit harder. Um, what we typically use is something called dobutamine, um, which pushes the heart to do a little bit more if for some reason you're not able to exercise. Um, you know, it's done in a, in a monitored setting, so we do watch you very closely with that. It does make people feel maybe a little bit weird or uncomfortable, but it, the risks are pretty low. And again, you're watched in a very monitored setting, so if anything does happen, we're there. Um, but that is an option, definitely, as are the nuclear scans, which sometimes don't require exercise, and there's a way to do that. It doesn't use the same medication to pump the heart. It actually uses something that makes the blood vessels dilate. Both of them can make people feel a little odd temporarily, but the risks are very low with either one of them. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Alashetti. It was very informative. I learned a lot um, putting the presentation together and also uh, listening to it. So uh, thank you all so much.
Um, we will send out um, a, a update from the chat. We will send out um, reminders of the upcoming workshops. Please feel free to connect with um, our partners as well. And um, thank you so much. Feel free to stick around and get information from the chat as well, okay? Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, and please, and just as a reminder, thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Dr. Al Shetty. Stefan put a bunch of resources in the chat box, so be sure to check those out. We can also email those out to you, the chat transcript with all those resources. And um, if you're available next Thursday, same time, same place, we'll be talking about um, multiple sclerosis and older adults, and we have a lot of exciting programming coming up. So hopefully you can join us again. And for those of you who come to our Healthy Aging Series at Brooklyn College, I saw a couple of you on this call. Obviously, we, we don't have those in person anymore, but thank you for, for migrating over to Zoom with us. And um, we're, we're happy to have you. And thanks again to Dr. Alashetti and our partners, Heights and Hills and Good Neighbors of Park Slope.